Uh, so recently I've been seeing a lot of blown up engine posts on Facebook and Instagram for some reason. I don't quite know what's going on out there. Now I've made videos in the past saying, hey, you guys should get these parts for reliability mods will definitely help keep your engine alive a lot longer. However, I've never made one describing what you can just do to keep your EJ alive or your FA. This can be said about any Subaru engine or any engine in general to prolong its life and hopefully mitigate any blown up, like blow up job, blow up jobs that your engine may do. So let's talk about it today. Now, one of the biggest problems that I see plague the Subaru community, and this is not at fault of the EJ, but primarily bad ownership, is problems going left untouched. And then people trying to tune on top of those problems, creating bigger underlying problems. I'm talking about maybe you just got a WRX, maybe you just got an STI, maybe you just got a BRZ, I don't know. I don't care what Subaru it is, they, they're all gonna react fairly similar to this. If you buy a car, and it has underlying issues like a misfire, oil leaks, power steering fluid leaks, coolant leaks, um, anything, oil and coolant mixing. You have to take care of those problems before you even progress with modifying the car. It's going to create bigger issues later on and it's going to come up and it's more than likely just going to completely grenade your engine depending on what the severity of the underlying problem is. I'm talking carbon cleaning on any direct injected Subaru, FA20s, FA24s as those are going to be coming out. You don't have port injectors so you're not going to be cleaning the backside of the valves, you're going to get a lot of carbon buildup. However, that's just going to lead to poor performance, uh, reduced miles per gallon and less fun when you're driving the car. Some of the bigger ones that I see are misfires. A lot of people let misfires just kind of go or they just kind of leave them lingering um, until the problem gets so severe that it starts to create other issues. Misfires are easy to fix you guys. If you do have a misfire it's probably it's either spark or fuel. Sometimes it can be air but for the most part spark or fuel. Spark plugs. Pull your plugs. Check them real quick. Super spark plugs are not that hard to check after you've like gotten your rhythm down of how to pull them out. I can get the plugs in and out of this car in about 20 minutes now uh, but then again I also removed a lot of things that were in my way of doing so. Uh, but spark fuel start troubleshooting like figure out where the problems are coming from another big one i don't really see this too often but oil changes sometimes i've seen let go a little bit too far i think the longest oil change i've seen someone do is like 9,000 miles ideally i would suggest doing them around 3,000. whether you're wrx or sti fa20 or ej uh, your your car is just gonna be a little bit happier with you these cars burn oil they get hot they consume oil. It doesn't hurt to do that 3,000 mile oil change. It's going to make your car a lot happier. Or just check your oil if you feel like your car is consuming oil. It's a turbocharged car. They're going to consume a little bit of oil. It's natural. I'd say belts, but I don't see belts too often. Um, timing belts are a big one. I haven't really, seen, actually I have seen timing belts get let go and people not change out timing belts. Change your belts. Accessory belts, that's just gonna give you a headache and it's just gonna annoy you if an accessory belt snaps, but the timing belt is the big one. 100,000 miles or 10 years. Those belts will degrade over time if you don't drive your car that often, you kind of let it sit in the garage um, and it's been 10 plus years and you're still on the original belt, get that changed. But, but like it's just basic maintenance stuff. Make sure you guys are knocking that stuff out. Next up is proper warm up of the car. These are not your dad's or your grandpa's Buick Regal, okay? You gotta let them warm up a little bit. Um, a lot of people tend to go off of the gauge on the dash. That's reading off of your coolant temperature of the car. That's not primarily accurate. Ideally, you'd like to go off of oil temp. If you can at least see a small rise in oil temp before you start driving the car, that's going to be more beneficial. Granted, most cars don't come with an, like an oil temperature gauge that you can monitor. It never hurts to put one in the car. It also allows you to just see what the car is doing if you're like taking it out for a spear to drive, taking it out to the mountains, or going to play with the car hard. Oil temp is a big one to consider. Like if I were to just throw the key in here, let it prime, make sure it's in neutral, and then start it. Oil temp's cold as hell! It's cold as hell! You want to let your oil temp warm up a little bit at least before you just start mobbing. So I can only harp on this one so much because I've talked about it in the past, but quality parts and buying the right parts. I see and I continue to see way too often people trying to cheap out on parts. I understand modifying cars is expensive. I understand that you want to save a couple dollars here and there, but when you start buying all these cheap parts, you're going to run into more failures with the car because the parts are not, either the parts aren't going to live up 
to the expectation that you're setting them to. The lifespan of the part isn't going to meet what it should be meeting. Like I've seen people buy, like secondhand parts are totally fine as long as they've been, like injectors for one example. If they're old injectors that you're buying off someone else, you wanna make sure they're flow tested properly sized and not damaged. O-rings, you can easily replace O-rings on injectors. That's not something that's like a huge worry. But I've seen way too often people buy way too cheap of exhaust manifolds. They crack, they break. You don't realize your car has an exhaust leak. AFRs start getting all sorts of funky and weird. Um, you lose boost, it creates other issues, and then the underlying problems continue to exist and get worse. Just, just nut up, buy the quality part. If it takes you a little while longer to save up for it, in reality, if you look at it, you can buy like a cheap set of headers off of eBay or a header for like, I don't know, $500, $400. Just wait the extra month or two if you're saving up money, putting a little bit aside here and there, buy the quality parts. ETS, Killer B, Grim Speed. I don't care as long as it's a proper brand that has a reputable and good quality put behind them. Secondly, don't stop this the madness needs to stop with this mix and matching of parts and not understanding how ots tunes work ots tunes are not awful they are not the end of the world however you guys need to keep in mind that if you're using like a cob ots stage 2 plus or stage 2 sf you need to only be using the cob parts listed in the map notes for that ots tune or else your car is not going to be happy Subarus are rather temperamental at times when it comes to tunes and the parts that you throw on them. If you're using a Cobb OTS tune and you're using a Grimspeed intake, that Grimspeed intake is not scaled properly to be reading on that Cobb OTS tune. AFRs are gonna be thrown off. If you have a fully catless, we'll say NVIDIA downpipe and you're using a Cobb tune, it is not scaled properly. You guys need to make sure that you're using the proper parts for these tunes. That's one of the huge detrimental things. These aren't even things that like you have to go out of your way to buy. Like if you do decide to go down the rabbit hole of modifying your car, make sure that you're just using the parts that are listed in the OTS tunes. If you decide to get an E-tune or a Pro tune, that's totally fine. Just make sure that they're from a reputable tuner who also knows what he's doing. Too many times have I seen people who think they can tune and they've tuned like five cars and then they go out and they try to tune other people's cars and then their cars blow up because they really don't know what they're doing. Just make sure you guys are getting the proper stuff taken care of. Like go to a reputable tuner. If you're using an OTS tune, make sure the parts match the map notes. Same with MAP, because a lot of you guys ask me about MAP staged tunes, I guess you could call them. Map, like map notes. Just read the map notes in the tune and they'll tell you exactly what parts to get. And no, you cannot run a boost controller on an OTS tune. Quit trying to do that. All right, Subaru nerds, let's talk about stock blocks because a lot of you guys wanna make power on these things and it's all right to an extent. And yes, I know Bader makes a lot of power on stock blocks, but most of us aren't going down that rabbit hole. Now, understanding your stock block is something that a lot, I feel like a lot of people don't fully grasp. To give you guys a brief rundown, 2004 to 2018 STI's short block, I like to call them the popsicle stick engines because you never know if you're gonna get like a somewhat strong one or if you're gonna get a weak one. The 2019 plus STI and the Type RA STI come with this short block, which is the Type RA short block. Now the Type RA short blocks are known to hold a lot more power. However, if you're going to modify your stock block Subaru and try to shoot for the moon on it, don't be surprised if one day you wake up and it decided to take off without you and send a piston straight to the atmosphere. I'm joking, normally it's just like rod knock or a spun bearing or something like that. But understanding the limitations of your stock block is, it. I don't want to say it's going to prepare you for the future, but it's going to prepare you to understand like the limitations and the capabilities of these engines. Yes, like it, like we said, you can definitely push these things as far as you are comfortable with, but remember, this is not a built engine. It's pretty much cast internals. It's open, it's semi-closed deck, semi-open deck, however you want to look at it, glass half full, glass half empty on that one. But Understand the limitations and the capabilities of your engine before you just try to throw modifications at it and hope for the best. Understanding how the modifications you're putting on the car affect the engine is going to greatly benefit you when it comes to planning out your parts list and trying to figure out how you want to modify your car. Which I guess that's another thing I'm going to like caveat on briefly is before you even start modifying the car, know what you want to do with it. If you're trying to make a drag car, that's entirely different from trying to build a street car or trying to build like an autocross car or a time attack car. They're all going to be built different. It's the same platform. Another important one that 
can be taken with a grain of salt because I don't want to cause you guys anxiety with your access ports is make sure that heavy knock is being monitored. Knock is incredibly detrimental to not only EJs but all engines. Essentially what's happening is you're getting detonation when it's not supposed to happen. That detonation then destroys the gas layer protecting the crown of the piston and protecting the valves and then you get a lot of heat that goes in there and that's when things can start melting and then if you get a lot of it and it's uncontrolled and you're not paying attention to it that's when you can end up with something like rod knock if you can catch knock early on via your access port then you're going to be able to keep this thing alive longer it's not just about how you modify the car but it's also about how you monitor it and how you are keeping an eye out on things it's kind of like it's kind of like your child yes you hate it at times, but yes, you love it a lot more at other times. And you want to make sure that it has a long and healthy life. So being able to monitor those knock signs is a huge thing to be able to do. And if you guys do want more information on like what to monitor with knock, I'll link somewhere in like this little screen area of the video, what to monitor on your access, like the complete access port guide video I did because it covers all that stuff. So this next one, I've mentioned it in the past before, but try to avoid getting hard like on the car when your IATs are high. If you're sitting in traffic, if you're in summertime in the desert of Arizona and for some reason your car's been parked on the side of the road and you're getting ready to do a pole, try to let your IATs get down before you start hammering on the car. That's going to go back to the whole knock thing that we just talked about. When you're introducing a lot more hot air into the engine, it gets a little bit more difficult to control knock. That's why whenever you go out and you start tuning or anything like that, you may see the tuner letting the car cool down a little bit here and there. You don't want super hot IATs in the car. I see. And with this, like if you're running a stock location turbo setup, you know, if you're running any turbo setup like this, this will heat soak after a while, even though it's rotated, even though the intakes kind of push away over here, the exhaust manifold is still underneath of this down below the car. So this still will heat soak. So it doesn't matter if you have a stock location turbo, rotated turbo, try to get some type of shielding around your intake. That way it gets cool air directed to it and you're trying to keep away all that hot air. We want to minimize knock as much as possible. That's one of the big things with these cars and that's something that you can do as you're going through and modifying your car is just make sure that you're not getting heavy on the throttle when your IATs are straight up through the roof because that's not what we want. And speaking of which, another one that I've seen that can potentially lead to premature wear is hammering on the car 100% light to light. I've seen, I, locally I see this a lot with WRXs and STIs uh, amongst other cars out there as well, but red light 100% throttle pulls. I don't understand, A, you're in traffic so you shouldn't be doing it anyways, but B, going 100% on the car for short intervals of time puts a lot of wear and a lot of stress on it when you're going 500 feet to the next red light. You have no need to get to 28 PSI by the next red light. I understand if you're like running someone a little bit and you're out in Mexico or something like that and you're doing like a couple quick pulls. But I see this all the time where just driving around town from light to light to light to light, people are hammering on their cars. Like there's no need for it and you're putting premature wear on everything. A, you're sucking in all those high IATs because you're going fast, stopping, sitting in a light, letting everything get hot and cook again and then you're sending it again. Let things cool down a little bit. There's no need, and you're just killing like fuel. There's no need for that. And the last one I got for you guys is just fuel. Make sure you, that you're getting a quality fuel. I've seen people put like 87 and 89 in their WRXs, their STIs. I really wouldn't advise it. The lower octane rating you go, the increased chance that you have of getting more knock. And knock is the biggest thing that we wanna control in these cars, so that way you're not getting that detonation that's gonna be destroying the crown of the piston or destroying the face of the valve. So you don't wanna burn a valve seat you don't want to burn a valve, you don't want to kill your piston, you don't want to break your ringlets. It's the high heat and the cylinder pressure that's going to destroy your engine. Being able to make sure that you have good fuel is going to help minimize those knock readings. So these are all things, like some of them, yes, as you're going through the car modifying it, keep this stuff in mind. If you're just going to be driving the car around, try to keep these things in mind as well. Like even if you're staying stock, like good fuel, um, don't hammer on the car when your IATs are through the roof in the summertime. Like right now we're going into winter, so that way the ambient temperature is a lot colder. So it is going to help a little bit. But these are just some things that you can just do. Like you don't have to buy any of this stuff up until you're going through the modification process. Even if you're staying stock, you can do a lot of these things just out of habit when you're owning driving and playing with the car but hopefully this helps reduce the amount of blown up engine posts I see online here in the next I don't know the future the foreseeable future because I don't want anyone to blow up their engine because it's just a 
it's not a fun thing to go through. It gets expensive quick if you can't reuse a lot of the things, depending on the severity of the the blow up job we'll just call it the blow up job but i mean that's really all i got for you guys on this one so hopefully this video helps uh, like explain and understand things a little bit better with subarus they're just like any other car out there you just they, they're just a little temperamental at times all right they just like to throw fits here and there but that's all i got for you guys on this one so if this video helped you if you like the video go ahead and hit that like button turn to black blue green yellow purple silver cyan whatever color it turns for you and if you're not already subscribed to the channel and you want to be i'll put it in one of these corners no idea which one quite yet but with that i will catch you guys in the next one which actually might be modifying the uh, the gold that we just picked up so peace out homies Ooh.